You are the salt of the earth, Jesus said. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by people. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before people that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts today be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name. Well, this morning, I want to talk to you about not being ashamed. About uh, not being ashamed of three things. Not being ashamed to believe in God. Not being ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news about Jesus. And not being ashamed of the church of Jesus Christ. I'm going to try to give you some ammunition to stand tall as a Christian. And to let your light shine. Because there are people. Uh, professors. Maybe I should dedicate this to my oldest daughter who's going to go to college. But there are professors. There are teachers. There are people in the world people on TV who are going to try to make you ashamed. You know, it's kind of like, uh, if you, any of you have ever played poker, I'm not advocating poker, cards, whatever, I know some people have a problem with that stuff. But if you've got a really strong hand, and your opponent has a really weak hand, the best thing they can try to do is bluff and pretend or make you think that they have a really strong hand so you aren't sure about what you have. And I want you to know that what you have is a very strong hand. I'm not ashamed, let's start off, I'm not ashamed to believe in God. Last winter I read this well-known, you know there were these in the United States, I don't know if you guys got them over here, there were four or five you know, atheist authors in the United States that were on the New York Times bestseller list. And so I read one of them last winter. Uh, God is not great. How religion ruins everything. By Christopher Hitchens. And let me tell you. If this book is the best that atheists can do. We don't have anything to be ashamed of. I could stand here and criticize it. You can. I got a, I got a great little book that kicks back at. Christopher Hitchens, called The Loser Letters, if you want to read it. But um, Hitchens doesn't say anything new. Yeah, he brings up problems. There's the problem. How can there be a great and good God and evil in the world? That's a problem for us Christians. You know, Job wrestled with that problem. It's in the Bible. That's nothing new. Do we have all the answers? No. Are there puzzles? Are there things we can't explain or fully understand? Yes. He brings up all the bad things that religious people have done over the centuries. We have that in the Bible too. Religious people crucified Jesus Christ. Does the fact that religious people have done bad things over the centuries prove there is no God? Nothing new from Christopher Hitchens. In fact, when I finished reading the book, I was more convinced than ever that there is a God. Some people look back at creation, and they look around them, and they see this created world, and they say there must be a designer, and that's important, and it's true. But I'll tell you for me, the thing that has always sort of pushed me to believe in God is not so much the backward look, but the forward look. If you don't have something beside, beyond the material, physical world, then I don't see how I can have any meaning. God is essential to have a universe and a life with meaning. If you have a world that's just material, and that's all there is, then when game is over, game is over. Did you ever why, wonder why all, you know, humans seem to be hardwired to believe in God? 
for meaning and existence beyond the grave. Most of us can't stand the thought that at our death, it's all over. That's it. And it's even worse if you think about that for your children, when you have children. And you know, someday, this world is going to end, like Michaela just sang, you know. And thank you for that, Michaela, that beautiful song. It's going to be all over someday. Now the scientists say about five billion years the earth will freeze over or whatever. Maybe, maybe it'll happen before then. Maybe we'll do ourselves in. But at some point, the human race and the planet Earth are going to end. And if there is no God, then gone into equal oblivion is the forest saved by the greens and the ovens built by the Nazis. It really never mattered ultimately. I can't believe that. I can't live that way. What will the headline be? Dow Jones falls. Earth is destroyed. <laughs> Christopher Hitchens has his points and his questions in his book, and I suppose the other atheists did too. Religious people have done bad things. Christians even have. Let's face it. We can't explain everything to everybody's satisfaction. How can there be a good and powerful God and still evil in the world? You can read the book of Job. He wrestles with that. But you know what? I'm okay with mysteries and unanswered questions. Mysteries woven into the fabric of the universe. You can't get away from it. You can't explain to me what was before time or what will come after. You can't explain to me where's the end of the universe or, or, or if it ends can't get your heads around any of this. I can't either. But I cannot live with a world and a universe without me. I cannot accept uh, Christopher Hitchens' idea that the center of all things is just a giant, empty, sucking void. <laughs> like there was, you know, remember, I just love it, the first chapter of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. He created all things, and he called, them, called it good. Atheism has no, no, no chance against the hopeful and joyous belief that the universe has meaning, that our lives are unending, and that justice will, will roll down like waters, and righteousness like a mighty stream. Atheism is a true loser. It has absolutely nothing to replace God. I am not ashamed to believe in God. Yes, sir. <laughs> I don't know why, why Hitchens does it in his book. I think he kind of tips his hand a little bit. He kind of gives away his whole argument at this one point. There's this, I don't know if you guys know the, the story of Whitaker Chambers. He was a, 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 an American communist, an atheist, um, and uh, he uh, tells the story, Hitchens actually tells the story of Whitaker's conversion in his book. Let me read you what Whitaker Chambers says, what, what happened, why he left his atheism behind. Whitaker Chambers. My daughter was in her high chair. I was watching her eat. She was the most miraculous thing that had ever happened in my life. I liked to watch her even when she smeared porridge on her face or dropped it on the floor. My eye came to rest on the delicate convolutions of her ear. Those intricate, perfect ears. The thought passed through my mind. No, those ears were not created by any chance coming together of atoms in nature, the communist view. They could only have been created by immense design. The thought was involuntary and unwanted. I crowded it out of my mind, but I never wholly forgot it or that occasion. I had to crowd it out of my mind. If I had completed the thought, it should have had to say, design presupposes God. I did not then know that at that moment the finger of God 
was first laid upon my heart. You want to hear uh, Christopher Hitchens, the atheist response? It's interesting. I too, he writes, have marveled at the sweet little ears of my female offspring, but never without noticing that A, they always need a bit of a clean out, B, that they look mass produced even when set against the inferior ears of other people's daughters, C, that as people get older, their ears look more and more absurd from behind, and D, that most lower animals, such as cats and bats, have much more fascinating and lovely and more potent ears. Thank you, Mr. Hitchens. Maybe that's why he's an atheist. <laughs> I have, Mary Beth and I have had three daughters. They're sitting there. The miracle of birth, of being a part of creation. Talk about a religious experience when you're in that room. Maybe Mr. Hitchens has shut himself off from something. Maybe he's the one who should be ashamed of something. That he can't feel that. He can't see that. Hmm. He tips his hand. It's a weak one. If you really don't feel anything when you see your baby daughter's ear, if you're that shut off from the mystery and beauty of creation, maybe that's why you're an atheist. I'm not ashamed to believe in God. Yes, no, sir. Me neither. <laughs> Second, I'm not ashamed to believe in the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen. You have your Bible, and you know something about the person Jesus. Here is this nobody from nowhere who Today, about a third of humanity on this big planet, in some fashion, people say they follow him. They call themselves Christians. Now, we know what that you know, doesn't always mean that much. But here's this nobody from nowhere. We measure our time from his birth. A third of humanity follows this guy. And even the religions that have been invented since have to make a place for him. You know, Islam, Mormonism. They reinterpret Jesus, but they don't ignore him. In fact, they give him a high place. It's different. You can't get away from him. Is it his teaching? I love his teaching. It's cool. You go back to it again and again throughout your life, you'll keep finding new things. Is it his miracles? Is it the way he treated people? Is it the way he demonstrated love? Is it his death? Is it his resurrection? Was it the incarnation? It's an amazing story. The whole thing is amazing. It catches people and it holds them. It's all of this. This is good news. Let's look at the cross, for example. I remember when I was in university in an anthropology class, there was a visiting professor from Cambridge University. And he made the point that in every single primitive human society, whatever that means, everyone practiced sacrifice. It's universal. Why? Why have humans everywhere and at all times throughout history recognized that something, someone has to die for the world to be made right? Why do we have this instinct? We know something. Why when we take that bread and they say, body of Christ broken for you? Why do we feel that we need this? Why a body? Why broken? Why for me? Why for us? Why do millions of people every week do this? Oh, I'm not ashamed. We know something. And then we say, blood of Christ shed for you. Why? Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us. 
Have mercy upon me for all I've done wrong, all that sin. Have mercy upon us, the human race, for all that we have done and all that we have not done that we should have done. Last week, uh, I reread this book because Kiki had to read it for school and she reminded of it. If you ever read the book Night by Elie Wiesel, he recounts his uh, story of, of concentration camp. He was a Jewish uh, teenager. And he lost his entire family. It's a, it's a great little book. It's just that big. You can read it in the night. And it just reminded me of the Holocaust, you know, and all the other things that we humans have done that are so, so, so evil. And, you know, I think we have an instinct where we know that we can't just say about all this stuff, ah, forget about it. No big deal. Move on. I tell you, it's a universal thing that we do when we take communion. We know that something is very wrong. We know there's evil. Go home and read about it. And you know that you can't just make this right by snapping your fingers. You can't make it lightly go away. It will take a great and dear cost to put things right, a cost we can't. Only God can do it. Yes, brothers and sisters, we need a cosmic sacrifice. All those primitive sacrifices that people have been doing for eons, they're all an approximation of the one that Jesus made. All are looking forward. When Jesus stretched out his arms and he died, Very, very big deal. And I'm not ashamed of that, to believe it. You know, when I was in the Philippines, and to all our Filipino friends, by the way, mabuhay. <laughs> when I was in the Philippines, I had a friend who was a missionary there to Filipino Muslims. And he, uh, I went down to visit him one day at his place down in a, little, in a Muslim part of Manila. And what he did is he, he had Bibles in Maguindanao and other languages from Mindanao. And he also showed the Jesus film in, uh, I don't know if it's Tagalog or, or one of the other languages, I'm not sure. But he said, Phil, watch this. And uh, so I stood there and I watched it. Full, the room was full of Filipino men and, and, the, and the movie was going on about Jesus' life and, and there was some banter and talk. But they were listening, but you know, it was just kind of normal, like watching a movie. And then we came to the crucifixion scene. And he said, Phil, this happens every time I show this movie here. Now, you know in Islam, uh, Islam teaches that Jesus didn't die on the cross. This is not something these guys believed in. But as the scene from the movie came up with Jesus being crucified, there was a complete hush in the room. Complete reverence and respect. Why is that? Because... This is a universal thing. The sacrifice and the sacrifice of Jesus. And I'm not ashamed of it. This is good news. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How about the resurrection that followed three days later? Uh, two years ago or so, my family and I, we, we, we took one of these uh, really cheap... Uh, group trips to Egypt. The, uh, what was that place called? Hergada. Boy, there's some very cheap flights from Moscow to Hergada. And uh, we then took this little uh, life-threatening ride across the desert to Luxor. <laughs> and it was awesome. We saw those tombs in the Valley of the Kings where the pharaohs spent, you know, oodles of money over many years uh, building burial, uh, you know, tombs and stuff. There was that giant temple of Hatshepsut, the, the female pharaoh. All of this effort, all of this expense to prepare for the afterlife. In Hungary, you know, those burial mounds that are, you know, again, 
for the afterlife. When they dig, when the archaeologists dig them up, there's all these grave goods and everything, and, and, and inscriptions and whatnot. And again, we have a universal thing. We humans, isn't that funny? Here we are, this species on planet Earth. We believe and we hope for a life after death. Atheists don't have anything to help us with on that. I remember when I was on a, uh, a fishing boat, and I used to be a commercial fisherman up in Alaska. And, you know, we were running at night, it's pitch black. You can't even see the, the, the black sky from the black water. It's all just, you know, just darkness. And if I'd leave the wheelhouse to walk back along the, uh, the side of the boat to get something to eat, from the galley or whatever, I realized if, I, if the boat took, took a pitch or I misjudged something and I fall over the rail, no one will realize I'm gone for about 10 or 15 minutes. Then they'll turn the boat around. It's too late. I'm gone. I'm crab food. <laughs> They'll never find me. And in southeast Alaska, you're, you're, you're dead from hypothermia in about 15 minutes in the water. That's about how long it takes. And you know, I was talking to an atheist friend at the embassy about this. And I said, you know, that's to tell you the truth, Tom, that's one of the reasons why I believe in God. Because that kind of thing happened to me. As I'm, you know, flailing around the water, and I'm realizing, okay, it's lights out for Phil. Um, I'm going to cry out to God. I'm going to say, you know, let's, let's talk. And, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing my family who've gone before and so on. And then there's going to be a funeral for me. Maybe uh, in Wrangell, Alaska. Of course, we didn't have kids in pups, so you've been the only one at the funeral. Um, and what are you going to do at the funeral? You're going to talk about how we're going to, my life maybe or whatever, how we're going to meet again. There's this hope of the resurrection. And in Christ, God has given us a taste of that. In history, he raised Jesus from the dead. I'm not ashamed to believe that. Now, my, my dad is 92. He's coming with us to Israel in about two weeks. And we're going to get these, uh, my, our three daughters are going to get baptized in the Jordan River. River Jordan is muddy and, wait, how's it go? Mud, River Jordan is muddy and cold, chills the body but not the soul. That's another one you guys in the gospel bar you do. Um, and my dad's 92. And I figure, you know, I'm probably going to bury my mom and my dad in the next 10 years. I might make it to 103. Okay, let me know. <laughs> I'm going to see him again. I'm going to see my mom again. I have that promise in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'm ashamed. I'm not ashamed of that. <laughs> I'd feel pretty embarrassed if I didn't have it. Jesus was not just a great teacher, a great philosopher. He was something far beyond that. He was the Son of God died, was buried, and rose again for our salvation and the salvation of the world. Third and finally, my last point, I'm not ashamed of the church of Jesus Christ. Remember that part in the Bible we just read. Let your light so shine before people that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Now you guys have to admit, we, let's face it, when you get to college, you're going to learn all about it. The church's discipleship has been far from perfect. Some of our greatest people we love to, you know, brag about as Christians. If you scratch a little deeper, you'll find out they're very human and very flawed. Mark Luther. I love Mark Luther. Uh, he had his problems. He had his faults. Mark Luther, let's go with the guy named after him, Martin Luther King Jr. Another, another great Christian who had his faults and problems. It hasn't been, it's not a perfect picture. And we have to admit those errors and we have to learn from them. We can't deny those things. But all in all, still, when I look at the course of, of uh, church history and, and what Christians have done, I'm not ashamed of, to be a member of that body. <coughs> Think about all the art that belief in Jesus Christ has inspired. How about the music? How about the architecture? How about St. Basil's? 
St. Basil's. It'd be a pretty uh, gray, ugly world without all that. You'll be challenged about this in university, sometimes fairly, sometimes unfairly. I remember I had a history professor who, uh, he, uh, he got up in front of us, we were like 500 students in this big amphitheater, and he said, you know, you know that song, Amazing Grace? It was written by a slave trader. <laughs> and then he, he left it that, thinking, wow, that's not fair. Yeah, Amazing Grace was written by a slave trader who got converted to Jesus Christ and gradually, not right away, gradually realized that he had done a great wrong. And before he died, he testified in Parliament against the slave trade. And he wrote that song partly because he felt so evil and so bad for what he'd done. He knew only Amazing Grace was going to pick him up. That was not a fair, that was what we call a cheap shot by that professor. Let me ask you this. What's the greatest humanitarian movement in human history? What movement has built more hospitals, more clinics, more orphanages, saved more people from hunger, uh, helped more people get off drugs, uh, deal with alcohol addiction, etc., etc.? What's the greatest human humanitarian movement in human history? Christian missionary movement. The world over. It's fantastic. Was it done without, uh, you African brothers and sisters, was it done without flaws, without error? No. But overall, a pretty good record. I wish I'd have brought them. Uh, Mary Beth has these little, um, what do you call, uh, you know, in China they did, they bound women's feet, you know? And Linnea, you're doing a thing on gender discrimination in school. I think that church's record in regard to women is pretty good too. Lifting women up, unbinding the feet, saying you are an equal uh, with men in Christ. It's important. The abolition of slavery. Quakers were the first. William Wilberforce. You know what I looked up last week? Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. Guess who started that one? Christian. Wilberforce. The YMCA, Young Men's Christian Association. It was developed during the Industrial Revolution to try to help young people stay out of trouble. Alcoholics Anonymous. There's another one. It was, it was organized and put together by Christians to help people break the slavery to alcohol. And they did something kind of interesting. They even said, you know, let's make this so it's even open to people that aren't Christian because they have this problem too. So they just kind of, they, they made it more like you just have to affirm a divine being at the beginning. They kind of generalized it. But to help people. The Salvation Army. I could go on and on. How about John Naismith? Does anyone know who John Naismith is? Who's John Naismith? Come on, eh? This is not John Naismith. Okay, so show, show me stuff, man. Come on. Dribble, dude. Dribble. Dribble. something? <laughs> and uh, later on, he actually became an ordained uh, minister in the church. Wow. Did you know that about basketball? Imagine the criminality and the juvenile delinquency that he helped prevent over the years by interesting 
<laughs> children in a healthy physical activity like basketball? Um. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Linnea. <laughs> Thank you. I got another friend here. Is Slava here today? Slava's not here. Slava Park. You know, if you ever talk, ask Slava Park about his recycling business. Slava is passionate about recycling because he said we have to be stewards of the creation. It's true. God said, take care of this place I'm giving you. There's another. If you go all over the world, you'll find Christians everywhere are being motivated and energized to do good things, to do good deeds. And it's very encouraging. Whether you're looking at trafficking issues, whether you're looking at prison reform, wherever you look, you're going to find God's people are busy and active. And it's one of the things I hope for for ICA, too. We're going to leave in a couple months. But one of the things I hope for for ICA is that you guys, I know you're doing it individually and in groups, but I hope as a corporate body, ICA will engage in sort of like those kinds of good deeds that lead people to glorify your Father in heaven. Amen. And so the church, it's not a bad record. It's a good hand. Though people sometimes will do selective history, Christopher Hitchens does it in his book again, and, and leave things out and, and distort things, um, I'm not ashamed to be a member of the Church of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Yep. I'm not ashamed to believe in God. We got it. I'm not ashamed to believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm not ashamed to of the church of Jesus Christ. What we have is hot, hot, hot. What they have is not as hot. <laughs> so as you go out into the workplace or school, you got to always rely on the Holy Spirit for, you know, discretion and wisdom. When is it appropriate to share? Or when is it, how you do it? I mean, I'm not... I'm not telling anyone how or when, but I'm telling you, never be ashamed because you have nothing to be ashamed of. If you, uh, let me read you something. The Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals was founded in 1824 by a group of 22 reformers, uh, including uh, William Wilberforce and Reverend Arthur Broom. The Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals was the first animal welfare charity to be founded in the world. Uh, and it was founded by English or British evangelicals. And then there's Naismith. 1916, he was ordained as a Presbyterian minister and he directed daily chapel services at the University of Kansas for two years. Another Christian. Huh. Inventor of basketball. Alcoholics Anonymous uh, sprang from a non-denominational movement modeled on first century Christianity. Um, let's see, is there anything else? Group members, they were called groupers then, were not primarily focused on sobriety, but some, such as Ebby Thatcher, found belonging to the group a critical aid in staying sober. Thatcher followed the group's evangelical bent and sought out former drinking buddy Bill Wilson to tell him he was sober because he got religion, and that Wilson could too, if he set aside his objections to religion, and formed a personal relationship with God. Wow. And the more you study, guys, and I'd say arm yourself, your heads, intellectually, the more you look into this stuff, the better you're going to feel about being a Christian. God bless you. Thank you, sir. We'll ask you to close in prayer. But I just think it's wonderful that we hear these truths and remind ourselves once again. I want to hear you. If you believe what I believe, as he has just expounded so well, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus Christ. 
I belong to the church. I belong to the church. Our Father, we're child in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. sisters, Lord, this week and make them powerful for you in Jesus' name. Amen.